In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we might take the things that we note and that they might become a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. So the last will be first. So the last in the field will be first in rewards. And the first will be last. For many will, for many will are called, but few are rewarded. Point one, many are believers. Many people believe in Christ. All of us here have believed in Christ. And so, many are believers. Point two, few receive reward. That's what comes out of the last part of 2016. Few are rewarded. Many of us believe in Christ. Very few ever receive the escrow blessings for both time and eternity. And point three, you should be the few. And that's because you've been exposed to doctrine. You should love it and you should be the few. If not, it's a matter of personal volition. And personal volition is a wonderful thing. And we can't live anyone else's spiritual life. I can't live anyone else's spiritual life. I've got enough trouble living my own so I can't go around dictating to everyone else how they should live their spiritual life. Except that I have the gift of communication. I commute it, communicate it from here, but uh, people can show up or not show up, and that's their choice. And the principle is you're rewarded based on your own interest in the Word of God, and no one can really... Uh, some, some people in your life might come along and motivate you in some way, but the true rewards that come, they're all based on what... You, you have done in your spiritual life whether you grew in grace or not. So the principle is this. When you live your spiritual life as unto the Lord and no one else, and you're not trying to please someone else, and you don't come to Bible class just because you want to please someone else, a principle comes out of that. Now for children, they're excluded from this because children are under the authority of their parents and children must do what the parents say. And if the parents are in disagreement, the children must do what the father says because the father's the authority. And if the mother and father are in disagreement, then the, the mother has the right to do what she wills, but the father is in control over the children. That's just the way God designed it. Welcome. And so, <clears throat> the fact is you must have grace. You cannot live anyone else's spiritual life. And when you have grace, grace brings relaxation. If you're living under grace, you're relaxed. You're not uptight. You're not upset. You're relaxed. And when you're relaxed, the Lord can use you. When you're upset, when you're tied up in knots, when you uh, feel as if uh, the whole world is uh, coming down around you and there's no hope for you, there's no relaxation in that. But when you're grace-oriented, there's a great deal of relaxation no matter what you're doing. So it is not who and what you are. And grace is something that we all come to understand later in life when we grow in grace and in knowledge, is that uh, uh, it is not who and what we are. It doesn't depend on us. It's who and what the Lord is. And that's why we have 20, verse 16. And this is our Lord telling the disciples, look, you've got your nose in everyone else's business. You're always in competition. And therefore, you need to understand that some of you who have been first are going to be last in the kingdom. And therefore, you need to understand that it's not who and what you are. The fact that you gave up Peter, the fact that you gave up your business and came and followed me, Peter, doesn't mean you're going to have all the rewards in the world. Now, you will receive rewards because later Peter gets with the spiritual life. But it's not who and what Peter was. It's not who and what the Apostle Paul was. The Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And the Apostle Paul can say that, so should we. So it's not who and what we are and what we do, it's who and what the Lord is. He's done everything. And the fact is, if God blessed us on the basis of who and what we are, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be saved, I wouldn't be alive, I wouldn't be breathing. Because who and what I am, I'm a sinful person just like everyone else. 
I was born into depravity just like everyone here was born into depravity. So if I depended on God, if I depended on myself as to how God would treat me, I would be dead and hell bound. And so would all of us. It all depends on who and what the Lord is, not who and what we are. Now in 2017, we have Jesus' third prediction of his death and resurrection. Matthew chapter 20, verse 17. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, in this case, he's going up to Jerusalem from Jericho. Now, if any of you have ever studied the synoptics in terms of the fact that uh, in Mark it says he's going not from Jericho, but to Jericho. And this has caused a lot of pain for a lot of people because they've seen from Jericho and uh, Matthew, and we'll get to this, and then in Mark they've seen to Jericho, and they say, how can you be going from a place and to a place at the same time? This shows that Scripture is not, in fact, or is not, or it shows that Scripture is fallible. That's what some people would come to the conclusion. But we must understand that there were two Jerichos, an old Jericho and a new Jericho. And he was going up from the old Jericho to the new one. So as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve aside privately and said, and said to them on the way, 2018, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, this is emphasis on the humanity of Christ. Of course, deity doesn't die. So this is complete emphasis on humanity. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priest and the experts in the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, to be flogged, and to be crucified. And on the third day he will be raised. So even though the, uh, what we notice from this is the blame, actually it, the blame is spread uh, not just for the Jews, but even for the Gentiles because they'll be turned over to the Gentiles. The Gentiles will mock him flog him and hang him on a cross. So the Jews really, uh, when it comes to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was voluntary. And we can't blame the Jews and we, uh, we can't blame anyone really. It's just the, the way it happened. And our Lord said that uh, He would do this. Therefore, it was His volition. That, uh, apart from his volition, none of this would have happened. If our Lord had, had not accepted the cross, the cross would have never occurred. So we can't play, place blame on a race. And in the uh, Middle Ages, all the Catholics, which would be the entire world, placed all the blame on the Jews, and from that arose a great amount of anti-Semitism. 2019 and will turn him over to the Gentiles. Gentiles, see, to be mocked, to be flogged, and to be crucified. And on the third day he will be raised. Now we're going to have a preview of coming attractions for the next verses. And what is occurring in the next verses, if you've looked ahead, and you probably have, if not, I'll tell you what's about to occur. James and John are going to want to sit in a place of honor. And they want this place of honor because they're first in the field. And we're still following, the, the first will be last, the last will be first. We're still, we're still following that concept. And so we have James and John wanting to sit in a place of honor. And there's a principle out of this because uh, actually this would be one of the best Mother's Day uh, sermons ever because this is a sermon dealing with an ambitious mother. Ambition for her two sons, James and John. Very ambitious. She wants her sons to be the best in everything. So the mother wants to promote the children. And she, and, and, and by doing so, she wants to take credit for how the children turn out. This often occurs. The children, if the children turn out well, oftentimes the mothers say, I want to take credit for that. If they turn out bad, they say, oh, they took after their father. And that's just a, a normal human nature. And that's what occurs. Uh, but James and John want to sit in a place of honor, but... Uh, not just them, their mother is pushing them very hard in this direction. So the question is uh, how you turn out. It really doesn't depend on how you've been raised. Now, there's some environmental things that go along with it, but in the end, uh, it, it turns out to, to be with your own volition. And some people have been raised in the most adverse and terrible of circumstances and have turned out to be wonderful people. 
But this mother is real interested in promoting both of her sons. And she's fair about it because she wants one son to sit on the right hand and one son to sit on the left hand. In other words, uh, she's not really a picking favorites. She wants both of her children to do extraordinarily well, which is understandable. But she's thinking in terms of human viewpoint, and she's not thinking in terms of divine viewpoint. But she's very concerned about her children. And uh, one thing that we could give credit to this woman about is that she relates success to their spiritual life. And she says, I want them to have uh, eternal rewards. Although they are, She's still thinking of them in terms of a temporal type thing. But she does want her children to have a relationship with Christ in which they will be the best. And so in that way, she's far better off than many others who want their children to be the best in other ways, such as uh, education, etc. And I don't speak bad about education. It's a wonderful thing. And all of you should strive as hard as you can to get through college and to be the best that you can uh, through college. But the one thing that can help you in all of that is knowing the Word of God. And if you know the Word of God, you can handle the pressures of college. And when you go to college and you receive a lot of freedoms that you've never had before, uh, you're, well, you're going to face a lot of things you've never seen before under this concept of freedom. There's going to be the wild crowd. They want to get drunk, do drugs, have parties all the time. You go that route, you're going to fail. And then there's the crowd that's interested in studying and all that and getting ahead. And if you go that, that route, you're going to succeed. But doctrine always helps you to sift through it. And in fact, people with Bible doctrine know when to work hard and know when to play hard. There's a time to work very, very hard in terms of life. And there's a time to play very, very hard. And it's not all work and it's not all play, definitely. There's a mixture of both. And when you learn Bible doctrine, you learn how to categorize it because you say to yourself, Bible doctrine's number one, uh, no matter what type of party's going on, if I haven't had my daily absorption of the Word, I better go do that. I'll join the party later. And it's okay to join the party as long as you don't uh, imbibe too much or do illegal drugs. But today, the way people party is you should probably stay away from it. Because most college parties, I went to college for a while and I know, most college parties are drunken orgies. And they are. And that's about as plain as I can put it. And uh, you parents need to know that too. That's what college is all about, drunken orgies. And that's what a lot of people go and have. And they don't really get an education. They just, well, they learn how to drink a lot and socialize. They definitely get a lot of social life. And they definitely end up in some terrible situations as well. But doctrine can pull them through that and they can be very successful in life both spiritually and economically. But if they never make it economically, so what? At least they have a spiritual life. And so this woman notices that and says, I want them to be rewarded by our Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, her emphasis is in the wrong place because she wants... Her emphasis is on reward. She, She wants her children to be rewarded immediately. She wants her children to be praised by the Lord and to sit at the right hand and the left hand. And it's natural for any parent to want their children to be successful. But in the end, it's their choice. And if their choice choice is for doctrine, they're a success no matter what a type of social status they eventually end up with. And every parent has great aspirations for their children, either to be famous sometimes or just to make it as a lawyer, doctor, whatever. They want them to get ahead as far as they can, and that's natural because you want your children to do much better than you ever did in life. Not that you didn't do bad. The true gauge on how you've done in life is on doctrine. And if you've made doctrine number one, it doesn't matter your social status. It just doesn't. Yeah, I could I could choose a whole different field and work my butt off and maybe make a lot of money. But that doesn't mean anything when it comes to the overall... Well, when it, you have to live your life in the light of eternity. And when you live your life in the light of eternity, uh, you'll be happy, poor, you'll be happy rich, you'll be happy middle class, you'll just be happy. And so most parents just want their children to be happy. And that's understandable. And the only way they're going to be happy is with doctrine. Uh, They could turn out famous and have all the money in the world and never be happy. And you would rather that they be happy, or at least most normal people would. So if you're in a lowly social status, 
and you have lived your spiritual life, you're still the greatest person on the face of the earth. Society doesn't recognize it, but God does, and isn't that what counts? It's what God thinks that counts. And while society says, oh, they're just a middle-class nobody, uh, God says they're somebody and they actually have an impact on the country, an invisible in impact. So this is a request from a well-meaning, sincere mother, very sincere. She loved her children very much, very understandable. And she wanted her children, both James and John, to be at the right and left hand of uh, God the Son. And by the way, this woman's name is Salome. Do you remember Salome? Now, for some reason, Salome has been a bad name in Scripture for any woman because Salome was the one, it's a different woman, but she's the one who had John the Baptizer beheaded. Salome chopped off John the Baptizer's head. And now here's Salome, she's a believer, and she wants her children to be recognized as the greatest because she's in the shadow of her children, and she too will be recognized as great if both her children could be recognized in the kingdom as being great. And we will see that, in fact, it is a temporal type of uh, thinking on her part because she thinks the kingdom is coming now. She thinks the Lord Jesus Christ has been born, and she believes in Him, and she's a believer, but she thinks that it's all going toward the millennium now. And she thinks that uh, there's going to be no church age. It's never been mentioned before. and Well, it has, and we'll see that from Psalm 118, but she doesn't know the Scripture. And so she thinks that our Lord is just going to conquer the Romans, take over uh, Israel, conquer the Roman Empire, and the new millennium will begin. And in that millennium, she wants her children to be in the, uh, the head of the political party, as it were, under our Lord. And so it is a type of temporary thought that she's having. And what this shows is she's completely ignored the parable of the householder. She completely ignored that our Lord had just said the first will be last and the last will be first. She was there, but she definitely wasn't listening because as soon as he finishes this parable, she comes up and says, Hey, tell me that my sons are going to be the best or make them the best actually issues an order to our Lord. And when she does this, she fails to recognize that all rewards are based on grace they are not based on legalism. What she's doing is she's in a jetliner, 747, flying from uh, Greenville Spartanburg International to uh, Seattle, Oregon. And she's up in that jet and she's dissatisfied, so she's going to jump out and push the jet. The jet is grace. You can't push it. And she's wanting to push the jet. And it's impossible. So she has just uh, inserted legalism into all this, saying, look, Lord, uh, I, I'm good and my children are good. Let them be number one. But she's not basing this on grace, and she's not thinking that uh, God is the one who is the solution, and God is the one who has uh, achieved everything and has given to us everything, and it's not on the basis of how we achieve. But she thinks it's on the basis of how we achieve. And so she's trying to push the jet. Salome wants to start with the kingdom. Salome, the mother. Salome wants to start with the kingdom. And by doing so, she's bypassing the crown. The crown comes before the... the uh, she's bypassing the cross. The cross comes before the crown. Salome wants to start with the kingdom, bypassing the cross. She wants her son to have... Uh, her sons to have an equal share in the spoils when the kingdom comes. And she thinks the kingdom is going to come apart from the cross. She doesn't understand the cross. She doesn't understand that Jesus Christ is going to have to die as a substitute for everyone's sins. She has no clue about that. She simply knows that the Lord is going to bring in the kingdom, and He is, but not now, especially not here, and not even today has He brought in the kingdom. So she's trying to bypass the cross. The same way Satan wanted our Lord to bypass the cross. Her thinking is distorted. She's in human viewpoint. And any time you're involved in human viewpoint, you're on the side of the devil. Every time you get involved in human viewpoint, you're on the side of Satan. You're promoting his agenda. And our Lord knew he had to go to the cross. And he's going to make it very clear to her that he must go to the cross. 
And it is phenomenal the ignorance that both she and James and John have. And we're talking about John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. We're talking about the John who wrote Revelation. We're talking about somebody who goes very far in the spiritual life. Yet we know from this he's not going to be the one to sit on the right or the left. Maybe, maybe that belongs to one of you. And that should shock you. James and John, they're not going to sit there. But you're in the church age. You're one of the last. Is it you? No, probably not. But could it be? Yes. If you use your volition to grow in grace and to grow in knowledge and you make Bible doctrine number one in your life, just maybe it's you that will sit there. Maybe it's my pastor. I don't know. Probably it's the Apostle Paul, but none of us know. There are so many believers from now till from that time until now and from now until the resurrection, we have no clue who it's going to be. But it could be you. Chew on that for a moment. But it's only going to be you if you make doctrine number one. If it's number two, number three, number ten, you're not going to get any rewards. You're going to be a loser. But if it's number one, you'll get rewards. And if you've gone the full route of your spiritual life, who knows, maybe you'll be the one sitting beside our Lord Jesus Christ as a ruler in the millennium. Maybe it'll be Laura K. Tapping, a handicapped girl who worked uh, under my pastor in the administrative staff. And she loved the Word of God and she was like a bulldog. And she didn't understand everything because, uh, well, he used large vocabulary. And she was nearly retarded. Nearly. But uh, under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, she understood some of the things that he said far better than probably any of us do. Now she's in heaven. Maybe she'll be the one sitting at the... And remember, sex is not the issue. It could be two women sitting at the right and left hand. It could be a man and a woman. It could be two men. But the sex is not the issue. And all of us probably sit here thinking, oh, it'll be two men. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be two women. We all have equal privilege and equal opportunity to grow in grace and in knowledge. So Salome has fallen into ambition on the part of her children. She wants her children to be the best that they can be, which is natural. But she is overly ambitious, ambitious for her children. Overly ambitious for her children. And sometimes this can be worse than spoiling your children to be overly ambitious. I've seen cases like this all through my life. Mothers and fathers both being overly ambitious for their children. And it's worse than spoiling the children because uh, the children are in the end going to make their own decision of what type of life they're going to live. In the end, that's the way it's going to be. Let's say uh, the father has been a great uh, military genius and he has reached the status of general. And he looks at his son growing up and he says, I want my son to be a general just like I am, except I want him to have five stars. And since I uh, paved the way, I'm going to teach him how to do this so he can have five stars. But then he comes along and says, No, Father, I want to be a, an engineer. And I want to engineer things. And I don't even care about the military. And then the father gets upset. Well, it's the child's choice in which way they want to go in life especially when they reach the age of 18. Now, before that time, uh, you have the authority over them, but when it comes to their uh, the, what they choose to do in life after that, uh, you keep your nose out of it, and that's the principle. But, uh, for example, my uh, pastor teacher, uh, he was a genius, of course. He could have been anything he wanted to be. And he was in the military and went very far. And then one day his father, uh, they were at a bar, at a social club type thing. Everybody was drinking, including his father. And uh, they were there. And uh, he finally broke the news to his dad. He said, uh, Father, or, or Dad, probably said Dad, Dad, I have decided that I have the gift of pastor teacher. At that time he probably said pastor. He didn't know about the Hendiades. I've decided that I'm going to be a pastor. That's my gift. And that's what I want to do in life. And his father laughed at him. And uh, he, he was from a wealthy neighborhood, so they usually gave toasts. And so he made a big show about it and said, uh, Oh, I toast you, my son, except he had a large vocabulary and knew how to rub it in very well. I toast him for wanting to be a pastor. He's humiliating him. 
and he says, uh, you want to be a pastor. You could have been anything, and now you want to be a pastor in which uh, people give you fruits and vegetables and all of that. And so, instead of toasting with the wine glass, he turned it upside down right there. Everybody else toasted him, but his father would not. And uh, that was a pressure he had to go through. But guess what? He stuck with what the plan of God was. And he said, well, whatever, I'm going to be a pastor. And he was cut out of the will. And I can't tell you how much money he was cut out of, but his uh, father and his grandfather were extraordinarily wealthy living in Beverly Hills. And they cut him right out of the will because he wanted to be a pastor. He said, I'm going to do it anyway. So he went to college and prepared to be a pastor. And then later in life, his father decided to come to Houston where he was now teaching at Baraka Church. And the father goes in and uh, hears him preach. He always thought of pastors as being kind of like wimps, you know. That was his view of them. But he heard his son preach and he broke down into tears. And he had finally come to realize he was wrong the whole time. And then he died and he's in heaven today. And that's a comfort to my pastor as well. So... Uh, the point is, you can't force your children into once they're old enough, once they get to the point where they've made their decision, they're going to go in the route that they want to go. And instead of humiliating them, support them. So mothers, uh, we, that would be a case of a father being ambitious for his son. And the Colonel Thames' father was very ambitious for his son. He wanted him to, well, he could have been president, he was thinking, and he was probably right. He could have been anything he wanted to be with such a brain like that, an engineer, uh, a five-star general, anything. And he wants to be a pastor, he couldn't understand it. So he'll never make anything as a pastor. The only thing the congregation will give him is uh, chicken and fruits. He'll never make it. And that was his issue. It was a temporal type thing. And then uh, you might be a mother who is ambitious for your daughter. Usually it follows that way. And in most cases, the uh, father like son, mother like daughter. Not, not always, but generally it's, that's the way it goes. And so a mother might be ambitious for her daughter. And she might want her to be the most uh, popular thing in the school and uh, the most popular thing ever, and that's just the wrong way to go. So don't uh, try to push your children into adulthood, and that's the principle. This is what this woman, Salome, is doing. And remember, James and John, by this time, are young men, but they're way past teenage years. James and John. And she goes up to the Lord, and she still has a heavy hand in their life. You can see that. Happy Mother's Day. It'd be a wonderful Mother's Day uh, type of, uh, of sermon. So don't push your children into adulthood. You train them for adulthood. You don't push them. And the training comes from making sure that they have Bible doctrine, number one. That's the best training you could ever give your children. I learned this early on. And I was never pushed, really, in academics, never. My parents kind of left academics on the side for me. And you might say, well, that's crazy, but that's what they did. Not until I got older, and there's an exception, and I'll tell you about it, even though they might not like it, but uh, it might be pertinent to this. And they never really pushed me in academics. They never really checked up to see if I did my homework or not. Sometimes I did, sometimes I didn't. But they pretty much left it up to me. I made it through high school with a pretty good grades, not the best, but I, that just didn't interest me to have the best, and I really wasn't interested in all that competition to know uh, the difference between parallel, perpendicular, 45 degree angle, 90 degree angle. I know what they are, but it's just a uh, big deal if you understand that. And But they did make sure that I had doctrine available every day. And they didn't force me to the point where I would resent it. And they just said, look, you're going to listen 30 minutes a day. This was when I was 8, 9, 10 years old. You're going to listen 30 minutes a day, and that's it. Any longer than that, I know you won't get anything out of it. You're a child and uh, you, uh, your mind works too fast, so you have to listen 30 minutes. So that's what I did. And then uh, they left it at that. And then when I was 13, I made the choice myself to go ahead and listen on my own. And so uh, the point is, uh, make, sure that, uh, make sure that you impress upon them that doctrine is number one. And that doctrine is what they need. The Word of God is what they need. That is what you should impress upon your children. Now then, when I got uh, older, 
I was actually enough old enough to make my own decisions after the age of 18. They said, uh, you're going to college now. And I said, I don't want to go to college. That's not my calling. Don't care for college. Oh, I could have made it in college. just didn't care for it. And they wanted me to because I got a music scholarship to the University of Alabama. And it, it would all be paid for except room and board. And they were willing to pay for room and board. So you would say, why don't you go? So I did go under some compelling arguments. I said, all right, I'll go. And then I got there and I said, I just don't like this at all. Don't like my liberal professors. Don't like anything about this. And I'm never going to make money uh, playing the violin anyway. Uh, let me just go back home. And that's where I wanted to be. Uh, and then I told them, look, uh, I think I have a communication gift of some sort. Maybe missionary, maybe a uh, pastor, something else. I want to study for that. Now, they didn't have the money to put me through seminary. And you have to go through four years of college anyway to go to seminary. First four years college, then you've got to go to seminary. And it just wasn't cut out for me in that either. And But uh, in the end, I made my own, cho own choices. And I said I had a communication gift, and here I am today. And uh, if it fails, at least I know that I did, that I followed what uh, I know that God's plan was. And so, you, and once it comes, uh, once they're past 18, they're making their own choices. Don't be disappointed in what they decide to do. If they decide to be a carpenter, well, if they enjoy it and they're happy, what do you care? What do you want? Success? What do you want to be praised because of their success? What's wrong with you? If they're happy, why do you care? But this woman, the principle out of all this comes out of this woman, Salome. And then in 20, verse 20, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons. And kneeling down, she asked something from him. 2021. 20, he said to her, What do you want? She said, Permit these two sons of mine to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. So she's already she's pushing her children ahead in the kingdom, which she thinks is about to arrive now. She doesn't understand that it's also dealing with the kingdom of heaven and that uh, our Lord is not going to kick the Romans out of Israel. She thinks they are. Then in 2022, 20, Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. And then he asked a very interesting question. One that uh, it's actually, the answers that come out of this are absolutely hysterical if you know what's being asked here. He says, Are you able to drink the cup? I am about to drink and be identified with my identification. They said to him, We are able. You don't know what our Lord's asking. I can tell, otherwise you'd be laughing. What our Lord is saying is, Are you going to be able to go to the cross and die as a substitute for the world? Are you going to be able to take the cup and the cup represents all the sins of the world being poured out on Him and judged, are you going to be able to take this cup? You want to be first in the kingdom? All right. Drink of this cup I'm going to drink of. That's what He's saying. Who's first in the kingdom? The King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Why is He first in the kingdom? Because He's going to drink of the cup of all of our sins. Our sins are going to be imputed to Him and judged on the cross. And He's asking uh, this woman, if her sons would be able to drink of the cup. Actually, he turns to the two sons and says, Are you able to drink of the cup? And they said to him, We are able. They don't even know what they're talking about. They're so ignorant, they don't even have a clue what they just said. Then he told them, You will drink my cup. And that means that after our Lord goes to the cross, and he receives the judgment of all the sins of all of human history, then they will be able to believe in Christ and receive the cup of righteousness. Oh, they'll receive the cup all right, but after Jesus Christ does all the work. You will drink my cup. And that's an illustration that we have when we do communion. Why do we drink from this cup here? And we put grape juice in it and drink of it. It's an illustration of the fact that Jesus Christ died as a substitute on the cross. So we drink of the cup today. And it's a representation of the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for us. You will drink my cup, but to sit at my, my right and left is not mine to give. Rather, it is for those 
for whom it has been prepared by my Father. In other words, God the Father knew in eternity past who would sit on the right and left hand side of our Lord Jesus Christ. No one knows but the Father. And He's the one who knows it and no one else knows it and it's not even the Lord Jesus Christ to give it out. So it could be one of you. If you're too busy with something else, it's not for you unless you get with it later in life. 20 verse 24. When the other ten heard this, they were angry with the two brothers. When the other ten heard this, they were angry with the two brothers. This is understandable because competition breeds mental attitude sin. When a bunch of believers get in competition, uh, look, uh, James and John here want to be the best. And, her, and their mother wanted them to be the best. And she thought that by enlisting her great wisdom that somehow our Lord would recognize that and say, yeah, you're right. Your children are the best in the world. Let me go ahead and set them up right now. And she thought that's the way it would happen, but no way. That's not the way it's going to happen. And when the other ten saw this and saw the interference of the mother, they became angry. And that's because competition breeds mental attitude sin. And if you're competitive in your spiritual life, it's going to breed mental attitude sins among others in the congregation. And that's why many large churches split up and fall apart. It's because there's too much competition. They're too busy being competitive. Who can be the highest role model for the women? Which mother can be? Which, uh, which father can be the highest role model by speaking with a fake tongue uh, of a fake spirituality? Which person can, can look the greatest? And then after a while, this competition goes all the way up to the pastor and they, I could do a better job than him. I could bring in more people than he could bring in, etc. And competition begins, and as a result, mental attitude sins. 2025, but Jesus called them and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those in high position use authority over them. What he's telling them is that the kingdom of heaven is not going to be run like the Roman Empire is being run. They're living in the Roman Empire. They're used to seeing people lording it over other people. And he's saying, look, the kingdom of heaven is not going to be like that. It's different. You're not going to achieve because of your human ability, your human talent, anything else related to your uh, human ability. That's not how the kingdom of heaven operates. It doesn't operate like the Roman Empire. And the problem with them is they want a visible greatness. They've been hanging out with the Lord now for more than two years, and now they want visible greatness. They say, we've hung out with you for so long, it's about time we got something in return. I want some visible greatness. And they were thinking in terms of, of what happened to David. David was great spiritually, so David was rewarded and he had a visible impact. But we're moving into a new age now. We're moving into the church age and all impact is invisible. And you might be the one person who's holding the country together and you don't know it and no one else knows it because it's invisible impact. Maybe the reason we haven't had an I know it's the reason we haven't had another attack is because there's some people out there who have taken enough interest in the Word of God to where uh, God has held back the storm clouds of the coming fifth cycle of discipline. But it's, it, once those people start to fade away and die and go to heaven, then the influence becomes less and less, and we are left vulnerable to the five cycles of discipline. So now it's invisible. Then uh, they were thinking in terms of visibility. I want to be praised by man for my greatness. A bunch of legalism. They had a lot to work through. The Apostle John here had a lot to work through and he finally did. And he wrote Revelation. And then in uh, 2026, our Lord gives an explanation. It must not be this way among you. They've been under competition and they're, they're trying to function like the rest of the human world functions. They're trying to function like the, the, the Roman Empire function. And our Lord says, It must not be this way among you, but whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. This is dealing with the concept of grace orientation. Humility. 
through application of doctrine and production of divine good. Now, this is developed through humility. And the greatest will be the one who serves, not the one who leads, but the one who serves. 2027. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Who is first in the kingdom of heaven? The King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Lord Jesus Christ. And why is He number first? Why is He number one? Because He is our... Uh, he went to the cross on behalf of us. That's why. And he, He's our servant. And He died as a substitute for us. In fact, the greatest servant ever. So because He came to serve us, and He came to serve us to do what? To bring us freedom. And He brings us spiritual freedom, which is far greater than human freedom. But the concept of human freedom follows the same logic. I don't know how many of you watch Braveheart, but I watched Braveheart just not too long ago for the 50th time, probably. And uh, there's a quote in there dealing with a servant, being a servant. And they were arguing amongst each other. That is, the, the noble people, the people who were noble, got into a fight amongst each other and they were saying, I'm going to be the king. And then someone else said, no, I'm the rightful king. I'm from this tribe. And they got into competition, much like the disciples are getting into competition. And Braveheart just turns around and starts to walk out. And then Bruce uh, steps in and says, where are you going? And he says, you think your title allows you to have properties and allows uh, people to serve you. But I think your title means that you must serve the people so that you can provide them with freedom. Then he walks out and they shut up. The concept is the same here. Our Lord served us so that we can have spiritual freedom. And there are so many principles from Braveheart. One day, when uh, I'm relaxed and we're all relaxed, we'll just play that one Sunday and watch it and have a lot of principles out of it because the principles are phenomenal dealing not only with human freedom but even if you apply it to spiritual freedom our Lord served us so that we can have spiritual freedom and went to the cross so that we can have spiritual freedom and suffered so that we can have spiritual freedom and today young men and women are in Iraq suffering under the hot heat many of them dying and getting wounded so that we can continue to have freedom you might not understand that but it's true so, 2028, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ became a slave by going to the cross for us. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was born outside. And this is something unique. He was born outside of the slave market of sin. He was born not a slave to sin. He was able not to sin and not able to sin. Posse non pecari and non posse pecari. Both. And therefore, he came into this world not a slave to the old sin nature, but he became a slave to all of us. Point two, Jesus Christ is first in the kingdom, but he became first in the kingdom by becoming a slave to all. And it took a tremendous amount of humility for the Son of God to become a slave to all. And it takes a tremendous amount of humility for us to grow in grace and in knowledge because we follow in His footsteps, not all the way to the cross, but we follow in His footsteps in terms of the protocol spiritual life. He lived the prototype, we follow the protocol. And so we follow in His footsteps, therefore it takes a lot of humility and we operate as a servant, as a slave, not as someone in competition looking to get ahead by the spiritual life. And so many people look at the spiritual life as a means to get ahead, as a means to promote themselves, as a means for people to give them approbation or approval and pat them on the back and say, yes, you are the most spiritual among us. That's what James and John wanted, and that's what all the other ten disciples wanted. They wanted to be recognized by others as being great, and our Lord brings it up, hey, I'm going to have to go to the cross. 
I'm going to have to become a servant. Therefore, I'm going to be first in the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you too must be a servant, a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, and you must be under humility, and you must grow in grace and in knowledge. Completely the opposite of the way they thought about it. They thought about it in terms of human ability and achieving in the human life. Now, in 2029, we switch subjects to the blind men being healed. 2029, as they were going out of Jericho. Remember, there are two Jerichos. In, uh, in uh, Mark, they're going into Jericho. In Matthew, they're going out of Jericho. And a lot of people have about had heart attacks seeing that, saying, Matthew says they're going out of Jericho. Uh, Mark says they're going into Jericho. Which is he doing? Both. Because there are two Jerichos. He's going out of the old Jericho, going into the new one. So a large crowd followed them. 2030. Two blind men were sitting beside the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted out, Have mercy on us, Lord, Son of David. Have mercy is grace in action. Have mercy on us, on us, Lord, Son of David. And this indicates that they recognize the deity of Jesus Christ and the humanity. Therefore, uh, these at least one of these blind men was a believer. From Mark, we get a different uh, type situation in which it indicates only one of them was a believer. But Matthew only indicated the one that was shouting, Lord, Son of David. So we know that at least one of the blind people was a believer. And then in 20, verse 31, the crowd reprimanded them to get... The crowd reprimanded them to get them to shut up. What they would do is walk by the blind people. And this is a large crowd, probably in the thousands following our Lord. And they look down and they see these two blind men, probably very unattractive, and they constantly shout, Lord, uh, Son of God, Son of David, have mercy on us, which is grace in action. And so they would walk by and see these people and they would stick their nose up in the air and say, Ah, shut up! and walk by. No grace orientation. These people were very legalistic. Probably many of them not even saved. And oftentimes what the masses of people do, they begin to have a mob rule type mentality. And if one person says something, they're all going to join in and start saying the same thing. Same thing happens in high school. One person makes fun of somebody else, the whole mob has to start making fun of that person because of the way they look, because of big glasses, etc. Well, I know a lot of you people who think you're popular, not here, but I know a lot of the people in high school who think they're popular, and I could give them a great Andy tongue lashing with the way they wear their pants down below their butt, and I could call them retards, because they are. If you wear your pants below your butt, you're retarded. Didn't you learn to pull your pants up above your underwear when you were growing up? You're retarded. And I can't believe parents let their children go to school with their butt hanging out. I'd get out of belt and spank the thing. Every, sp just <laughs> lay into it every time I saw some underwear. Pull it up, buddy. Are you retarded? Nobody wants to see your ugly butt in your underwear with your stains all over it. It's just stupid. It's so stupid. But this is the crowd mentality. And when people get in crowds, they'll do the stupidest of things. And one person walks around, Ah, oh, shut up, you old blind so-and-so. Then somebody else would walk by, Yeah, shut up. And just the crowd mentality. And they have no compassion. And if you ever follow the crowd, you'll be one who has no compassion. No compassion for blind men. Probably born that way. Probably not too attractive, but they can't help it. We're either born beautiful or born ugly, and it's not our fault either way. And it just, uh, that's the way the crowd thinks, this mob rule type of mentality. So the crowds, while they're enthused by the ministry of Jesus Christ, they don't have any grace orientation. They have their nose stuck up in the air. And worse than that, they have their nose stuck in our Lord's business. They've been hanging around the Lord, and they think the Lord can't handle these two blind men, so they say, we'll take care of him, Lord. You shut up. But that's not the way our Lord functions. He's separate from the crowd. He's not going to make fun of two blind people. What He's going to do is heal them, make them see. And the crowd should have known that, knowing that our Lord had committed miracle or uh, performed miracle after miracle after miracle. So a point out of this is that busybodies and nosy people are always a hindrance to the Lord's service. They thought they were helping the Lord by going ahead and saying, Shut up, you old blind people. But they weren't. They were being a hindrance. They were prying into our Lord's business. It was up to the Lord whether He would talk to these blind people or not. Not up to the crowd. 
And that's the way many large churches function today. The pastor hands all authority over to the majority and the crowd instead of putting his foot down and saying, this is the way it is. If you don't like it, get the hell out. And I do have a right to say that. Get the hell out if you don't like it. And if more pastors did that, maybe there would be more people listening, but I doubt it, because the Lord provides uh, the a number of pastors necessary for those who are positive toward the Word of God. So what they should do is get a backbone and uh, stamp. Uh, it's like a bleeding. If somebody's bleeding, you have to, uh, a lot of times in the past, when they didn't have the medical research we have, they would just take a hot iron and tear off the bleeding. And it would hurt terribly, but that's the only way to stop the bleeding. And in these churches, there's a lot of bleeding in which the people are trying to take over. They're nosy busybodies. And what the pastor needs to do is bring out the uh, iron that they poke in the fire and just start on the people so that either they'll get humble or get the hell out, one or the other. There's a choice they make. And that's the way that church is to function. And this is the way our Lord is going to function. He's not going to listen to the crowd. If it had been up to the mob, what would have happened? These blind people would still be on the side of the road blind. And they had no compassion. But it wasn't up to the crowd. It was up to our Lord. And the principle out of this is that man always wants to deal with man on the basis of legalism. Just because these people couldn't see, just because these people were not like all the other people, they're going to make fun of them, tell them how to act, tell them uh, to shut up, lord their authority, so-called, over them. So they're dealing with them on the basis of legalism. And oftentimes, we deal with people on the basis of legalism, and we don't even know it. For example, if someone's nice to you, you're nice to them. That's usually how it works. If someone insults you, you insult them back. You treat uh, people usually on the basis of whether they earn or deserve your kindness. If they don't earn and deserve your kindness, you're going to talk bad about them. And that's not the way our Lord functions. That's not the way we should follow the Lord, and we shouldn't function that way either. There's a lot of obnoxious people that may not earn or deserve our kindness and our compassion, but it's not based on who and what we are. It's based on who and what the Lord is. And therefore, if you are functioning under uh, who and what the Lord is, if you're functioning under the unique spiritual life, then you're going to function as the Lord does, and you're not going to think in that manner. And you're going to be gracious toward those who insult you, and you're going to be gracious toward those who are obnoxious, and you're going to be gracious toward those who are nice to you. In this manner, it does depend on if you've learned the Word of God and have gotten to impersonal love. But you're following in the footsteps of Christ when you can do that. And you're not functioning under legalism. And you're not insulting people because they insult you. You simply function under impersonal love. So the two blind men have approached Jesus Christ on the basis of grace. What they have done is they've put the whole situation in the Lord's hands. This crowd has not. They're trying to take the situation out of the Lord's hands. And they're saying, you blind people, shut up. And, uh, but the blind people are doing exactly the right thing by saying, have mercy, O Lord, Son of David. Have mercy, Son of God, on me. Mercy is grace in action. Mercy is compassion in action. And they know our Lord will pull through. So the principle out of this is whenever you approach God on the basis of grace, you're going to get an answer. These blind men approached God on the, or approached Jesus Christ on the basis of grace. And they said, uh, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. They did not say, Have mercy on us because we've been to synagogue every day for the past two years. They didn't say, Have mercy on us because we've been giving 10% to the synagogue. And they didn't say, Have mercy on us because of who and what we are. They said, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. In other words, have mercy on us on the basis of who and what you are. We're nothing and they know it. And oftentimes people in situations like that realize it before others. They can't see. They're helpless. And they know they need help. And they're not ashamed of asking for it from the perfect Savior. So the mob, the principle from this is, the mob with its thousands of people was wrong. All those people were wrong. How, how many of you like to follow the popular mob? How many of you, uh, especially in high school, this is a big problem, and it carries on into adult life as well. 
You follow the mob. You follow what is popular. These, this mob follows what is popular. And uh, if, uh, two, if, uh, if some guys start wearing earrings in both ears, then everybody else starts wearing bo- earrings in both ears. And if the whole mob does it, then all the men start looking like faggots with two earrings in their ear. And the mob is wrong. I never went along with style in high school. I didn't give a damn what people thought. I could have cared less. And I'm sure some of them made fun, but I didn't care. I wasn't going to follow that idiocy. It was stupid. The mob is stupid. And a lot of people vote on the basis of polls. If a poll shows somebody's ahead, I'll vote for that person. That They'll follow the mob. And that's why the media propped up polls, because they know the mob mentality. And they know that if they say, George Bush is extremely unpopular... Everybody will say, hmm, I don't like him either. Nobody else likes him. I might as well not like him. And so the whole mob thing keeps going, even into adulthood. And if, that's, if you go along with the mob, you're going to be stupid just like the mob. The mob is not the best way to go. So 2032, our Lord goes completely against the mob. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. 2033, Lord, they said to him, let our eyes be opened. 2034, moved with compassion. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. The mob wasn't moved with compassion. The mob did not have compassion. Only grace orientation brings compassion. Moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed Him. Our Lord Jesus Christ is functioning under grace orientation in which He possessed great compassion. He had great compassion on these two blind men. The rest of the people did not. They were uh, settled in making fun of them like everyone else did. As long as somebody made fun of them, well, they'll make fun of them too. And our Lord separated Himself from the mob and had compassion on them and restored their sight. So He's functioning on the basis of grace in which He had great compassion. So the basis for divine blessing is who and what God is, not who and what we are. Obviously, the crowd thought highly of themselves. You don't go around talking to a blind person, telling a blind person to shut up unless you think you're someone in authority. You ever just walk up to somebody when they're talking and uh, uh, trying to talk to someone else, they're not even talking to you, and you say, shut up. That's not grace orientation. That's not compassion. And the mob didn't have any of that. Completely ignorant, and obviously many of them were not saved. And crowds never do have compassion. Mobs never have compassion. So the uh, principle we can gain out of this is that if you go to most large churches, not all, but most large churches, most of the believers in those churches are cruel. They're not grace-oriented. They're not compassionate toward each other. They're always in competition. And what they do is they stalk the congregation like a cat. My cat stalks everything. Sometimes he stalks me. And then uh, if I make a movement with, with my leg, he latches onto it and makes me scream. But they just the cat will just peer down and look, and you know when he's stalking and he's looking at you, and he's waiting for you to make one wrong move. Well, that's what many believers in congregations are doing today. They stalk. They find somebody they don't like, and they crouch down, and they wait for them to make one mistake or a perceived mistake or to break one gimmick that they've been holding on to or to uh, break some type of uh, taboo that you have developed in your mind. And as soon as they do, you hop on them like a cat with your claws all drawn and rip them apart. That's not the Christian way of life. Yet that's the way most churches function today. Let's Let's just rip each other apart like the disciples have been doing. So our Lord has to straighten them out. And it's taking verse after verse after verse to get it through their thick skulls. This isn't the way to function. You don't rip each other apart. You don't rip each other apart like a lion or a tiger or or a piddly little cat. You just don't do that. You must function under the principle of grace. So faith, and one thing that the blind men bring out, is faith is evidence of things not seen. They couldn't see. They never saw our Lord Jesus Christ. They never saw with their very own two eyes a miracle, yet they believed our Lord could do it. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, having never seen a miracle. 
Yet the crowd with their eyeballs had seen many miracles and yet they still didn't have grace orientation and they still didn't know that the Lord was in charge and He's the one who's going to take care of everything. But the blind people knew it. Why? Because of faith. Faith is evidence of things not seen. They couldn't see, but they had faith. And they had more faith than those people with eyeballs. That's a principle. And we've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ, yet we believe in Jesus Christ. Why? Faith. We didn't have to seem to believe. And sometimes when you go into witness sessions with people, they would say, if only God would show Himself to me, I would believe. And that's a lie. It's not true. You haven't seen Him and you've believed. These blind men didn't see Him and they believed. And uh, there's enough evidence of God to go around anyway. It's all over. The fact that we breathe is good enough evidence for me, but... uh, you can't see wind, can you? No. So, but I can feel it. Well, if you're out in it, you can. But if you're in your house, you can't see wind. You might be able to hear it. So there is some empiricism in it. But uh, the only way you can tell if the wind's blowing is to look at the tree branches and see if they're shaking. So, therefore, you know it's windy outside. You wake up and you see the trees going, and you hear it, so you know it's windy. But you can't see it. And there's enough evidence of God, just like wind, so that uh, any atheist is retarded. Well, they might be geniuses, but in my mind, they're just stupid. How could you think there's no God? As if it would be like taking alphabet soup and dumping it into a bowl or just slinging it across your house thinking it's going to make a beautiful poem. It's really the way it is. And it doesn't. And so, there is a God, and anybody who says there isn't is a fool. So your criteria as a believer must always be what the Bible says, not what people say. The crowd that has been passing the blind man, the blind men, has been going along with the other crowd. And they're all going along, ah, shut up. Ah, shut up, you blind people. Very uncompassionate. But your criteria as a believer is not what other people say, but it's what the Bible says. Some people will never get with the Word of God because they're more interested in what people have to say, they're more impressed with people than they are with God, and they're more impressed with people than they are with what the Word of God has to say. And if a person says so-and-so is ignorant and stupid and an idiot, they'll just go along and believe it. And if a person says you must invite Christ into your heart, they'll go ahead and believe it. They, They care less what the Bible says. Their pastor said that was the way it is, so that's the way it is. But what's the Bible say? Is he even quoting the Bible? No. And a lot of people are not impressed with what the Bible says. The Bible steps on their toes. They don't like it at all. And they're more impressed with the other people who like to talk about the pastor who stepped on their toes. But it wasn't the pastor who did it. It was the Bible that did it. And it would seem like some people would rather know what a verse has to say than to get offended by a verse. That's just my thinking. But that's because some people are more impressed with who and what they are than with who, what, who, and what, uh, what, who and what the Bible has to say. Therefore, offended. So your criteria as a believer must be what does the Bible say, not what does people, not what, what do people have to say. Who cares what people have to say? What does the Bible have to say? And so the crowd goes along with everyone else You blind people, shut up. And our Lord comes out with grace and says, Don't shut up. You come up here to me. And He touches them on the eye and they can see. And that being able to see represents their faith. And faith is something that we all need. The faith rest drill is a wonderful thing. And one day we're all going to have to use it. Most of us already have many times. But one day we're going to have to use the faith rest drill and we're going to have to rely on a God we cannot see. And we're going to have to rely on doctrine that you've been learning or hopefully learning. And if you haven't been learning and the test comes along, you're going to fail. It's just like in school. In school you've got a lot of tests. And what do you do? You study for them so you can pass it. If you haven't been studying the Word of God, you're going to fail every test that comes down the pike and you're going to be miserable. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.